Well, I was the oldest in the family, so I pretty much helped with farm work. My dad always took me out in the field and taught me how to do things out in the field. In the springtime, Pete had to go out and do the field work, and somebody had to clean that barn the cows were in. <laughs> There's a lot of work on a farm. I think I stayed in farming because it was my dad who pushed me and made me feel it was just part of my background. It's a simple life, and I think that we take for granted what we have here because this is our norm. Your faith has to be very high. You start the day with your faith and you end the day with your faith. That's what gets you through a day. Some women are really into it. They do everything that the husband does. I mean, they help with the cattle, the vaccination. There are some families that the woman is totally involved. In fact, they're co-partners. That's one thing that I've been very blessed with because my husband has always treated me like an equal partner and has never thought anything different. I believe it's changed because I believe there are more women that are in agriculture now that have bit the bullet and just done it. Right away when I first got married, I think the idea of women working out of the house was like, ah, uh, you know, you should be home helping out on the farm. It's changed over the years. People realize that one income just isn't enough nowadays. If a young man's coming back to farm, what's his wife supposed to do? She's gonna need a job. Many, many farm wives work off the farm. But the biggest change in women's role in agriculture is the fact that they're finally getting recognition. Production funding for Women Behind the Plow is provided by the Tri-County Tourism Alliance, the Op Mertz family, the NDSU Library's Germans from Russia Heritage Collection, McIntosh County Bank, the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public. Why would a woman remain on a farm, confronting weather extremes, as well as unending labor and numbing isolation? Some women fail, unable to face the drudgery and pain of incessant responsibilities. For others, a force within the woman binds her to the land, to family, and to grinding routine. She learned her lessons from a network of other women, from life and death surrounding her, and from the inevitable children who leaned upon her for sustenance and support. She attained success by dodging ruin. Often restraining her complaints, she faced whatever fate placed before her with resolve, at times laughing, at other times weeping, but ever solving both the great and the small problems of daily life. This collection of narratives illustrates the fortitude, the strength, and the resilience of women who prematurely soiled their hands and bruised their bodies for neither fame nor fortune. I was lucky because during the school, when I was in activities, I got a break from doing farm chores. I didn't really like running track, <laughs> but it was better than milking cows. My goal after high school was not to marry a dairy farmer. I even told my dad when I left for college, when I go to school, if a guy asks me out, I said, the first thing I'm gonna ask is if he's a dairy farmer. I said, and if he's a dairy farmer, I'm not gonna date him. I remember we went out in an alfalfa field where my dad was swathing down by the river bottom and we're sitting in a pickup and dad gets out of the swather and comes over and looks at us and asked him, can I marry your daughter? And my dad did not skip a beat. He looks at me, he's like, Sue, you know he's a dairy farmer, right? <laughs> I do most of the field work here. It kind of works out really good because my husband doesn't like the field work 
and he likes milking. So he does the majority of the milking where I do all of the seeding, all of the baling, raking, haying, everything, everything else I do in the field. But the passion that we have for the dairy industry isn't so much in milk production, but the genetics of the cattle. We artificial inseminate every animal on the farm. We also do embryo transfer work to promote better genetics throughout the herd. We show cattle everywhere. That's where we are most excited about the dairy industry, is the genetic part of it. There was no better place that I would want to raise kids than in a farm setting. Just the value of hard work, perseverance. Your kids grow up knowing they can't be self-centered because there are chores, there are responsibilities, there's animals to be taken care of. And a lot of that, a lot of times that comes before your own <laughs> needs. I think we're coming into a generation where women are more recognized in agriculture. It's come a long way. For my grandmother and my mother, they worked on the farm alongside their husbands, but it was never referred to as both of their farms. It was always referred to as their husband's farm. As a woman, you devote your life and you work side by side with your husband. And people looking in from the outside, sometimes they make a judgment that it's your husband's farm and not yours too but it has gotten a lot better over the years. That's one thing that I've been very blessed with because my husband has always treated me like an equal partner and has never thought anything different. You want to pass it on to the next generation. You don't want to be the last generation on the farm. I wouldn't want to know what it feels like to have to sell and knowing you were the last one because it's something that you take pride in and each generation tries to make the farm better for the next. And it would be a very sad thing if you were the last. I was outside and we thought it was really dust storm. And then he looked up and he said, I think we're getting rain. And I looked and he said, they, the closer they got, it was all grasshoppers. And they were just all over. We had to go into the house. They were terrible. You had to put on your lights, and we put our kerosene lights on in the house. We never went hungry. We had chickens, ducks, and geese. And my folks always raised pigs. We butchered every year. Two pigs made sausage, head cheese, summer sausage. We had a garden too. My mother had one right beside the tank. And we had another one that they called the Bashtun that was made out at the farm, uh, away from the farm. And we did potatoes, pumpkins, and watermelon, all that stuff out there. Dad always took the extra milk and the water and we had a five gallon pails and we'd soak that. And you know, when you came to their troughs, they just about run you over. They were pigs. I know my brother had a stick and he'd whack at them all the time. So you could even get the feed in there. But then if they had it, then they let you alone. My dad did a lot of corn. I know even in the dry years, he had a corn crib. And then we had to take the corn cobs and we used them as fuel. My mother said it was the best thing to bake coffee cake with, the corn cobs and wood. I don't know how those people, I said to my mother, didn't your house smell? They had that big box in front of the stove and the manure was in there that we picked. Corn cobs, wood, whatever you could find. It was so quiet, you, you could do everything you wanted to do out there. You had your chickens, you had everything you raised and canning, your gardens. Growing up as a young girl on the farm, I was with my dad at his side at all times. If he was in the field mowing hay, I was in the field mowing hay, we were together all the time. I think I stayed in farming because it was my dad who, who uh, pushed me and 
made me feel it was just part of my background. I started working with Dad Boy when I was young. I was probably seven or eight going out and helping him. My biggest thing was always the cows, the baby calves, that was always the highlight. After I got married and I moved to this farm with my husband, I wanted that agricultural background in me to come out in me more. And I do help a lot on the farm. I do want this agriculture business to continue. I treat my kids as I was treated growing up. I push the farming aspect quite a bit. My husband does too. He was very active in FFA. I was active in 4-H. So you put them two together, you're going to try to push your kids. I never cooked with my mom, and I hate cooking now. <laughs> I don't like it. I would rather be outside working with the cows, doing anything outside related that I don't have to come in and cook. My favorite season on the farm is calving. It always has been. Watching a cow give birth to a newborn calf. The birthing part of it is just amazing that you can transform that and you can go from zero one day to 500 in a month <laughs> and have a lot of them running around. When you put them out to pasture, you look for them when you make sure they're doing good. But you do always have the tribulations of losing some and I take it really hard when we do lose some, but it's part of life. You can't save them all. You try, you try. Having three daughters, I'm really excited that one of them did go into the agricultural business. That was kind of a shock to me, that she wanted to go to college and do that. And I'm glad she did. I'm so glad she did. I just graduated college in April, and I am back on the farm where I help my dad out, and I also took a job in Napoleon as a bookkeeper at a law firm where I work 20 hours right now there a week, and I also sell Ray hybrid seeds on the side. When I started growing up, I was with my dad and my grandpa a lot. Being the oldest of the family, I was always outside and my family likes to push agriculture, so we were never really in the house sitting around or watching TV where there's always something to do. And my dad started pushing me to work on equipment and work more outside, which threw me to the farming aspect. And my getting up where I'm 19 now, my grandpas are starting to retire and they're the ones that asked me before I graduated high school, if you're really gonna go into this, we'd like to talk and try to help you out if you wanna stick with agriculture. And that's what drove me the most. I never really was interested in anything else in high school, more driven towards the farming aspect or the bookkeeping aspect of it. The assets that have to be put into farming, I don't know if I see myself by myself, either future. I see myself staying with my dad and possibly marrying a farmer myself to start our own family on our farm and push farming. But I do definitely see me staying with my dad, working with my dad, sharing equipment. So that way I don't have to take all the assets on myself. We can just help each other back and forth. The number one technology thing that gets used the most on the farm is our cell phones. If you break down or if you need something, you call right away. You don't go run after them to find them. The other farming thing that we use the most is GPS and the tractors. That gets used in every single tractor we have. Every equipment, it all gets used GPS. It's the simplest thing to do. I can't imagine not using GPS back in the days. I do like cows a lot. I have about 40 cows of my own. So I'm out there a lot with the cows. My mom is a lot more into calving than I am. We take shifts, checking cattle. I'll do the night shifts and my parents do during the day shifts but I'm definitely out there helping if anything goes wrong or if we need help with a calf or feeding. I feed every morning with my dad. When I was thinking about my future, I want to farm, but if I get married to a farmer, obviously times are tough right now and you aren't both gonna make it farming strictly. So coming back to Napoleon, there are some places you could get jobs as an accountant and I was just happy enough to find one. So I just kind of step my foot into there and hopefully it keeps growing from there. Well, I was the oldest in the family and my brother was three years younger. So I pretty much had to do the farm, help with farm work. 
My dad always took me out in the field and taught me how to do things out in the field. <laughs> We'd done everything by hand. We had no milk machines or anything like that. Everything had to be done by hand. I think I liked cutting hay about the best of anything. And then I like the animals too. I like to take care of animals. Milking cows when it was so hot outside. <laughs> that I didn't like. And you know, we had no air conditioning there and sometimes there was no breeze whatsoever. And the flies were bad and cows would kick. Sometimes the milk bucket would fly with the milk. <laughs> so that was one of the worst parts I think there was in the farm was milking. We didn't get to town very often. And the summertime, usually on Saturday nights, we got to town. And that was a great treat for us to get to town. We had friends in town and we could go with and have fun. Oh, we just run around town and talked and had a little money and we spent that and had ice cream and stuff like that. That was fun. <laughs> At least it was a different deal, you know, when we got to town. We went to Glickstall Church. That wasn't too far from home. And usually we always went to every Sunday we never missed. And sometimes it was so cold and then we drove with a bobsled in the wintertime with a lot of snow and Dad made us lay down, had a blanket in there and then we laid in there and he covered us up over our heads. <laughs> and we didn't want that especially at the Christmas program came along. Well, we had our hair fixed, and here he puts the blanket over our heads. <laughs> we never liked that part. But anyway, we got to church then and took part in the Christmas program. Grandpa was so strict, too. He didn't think you should go do anything on Sunday, hardly. Not even cut paper. We used to cut out pictures of dolls and catalogs and make clothes for them and stuff like that. And he didn't think we should even cut on Sunday. No scissors. <laughs> That's how strict it used to be, and that all faded away. I always think of the hay, the smell of it. That's one thing I never forget. I thought that was the most wonderful smell, especially if there was clover with it, and you cut that. Oh, man, that was better than any perfume. <laughs>
yes, I'm married to a farmer. Well, you are just as much of a farmer as he is. I think if a woman is prepared for what is to come, because there's tough times too. It's not a nine to five by any means. And it's not a, a regular paycheck at the end of two weeks. There are challenges, but the benefits of living on a farm, working in agriculture for a woman now are just as powerful as they've ever been. I raise livestock, I have cattle. I have about 110 stock cow operation that I run by myself and I also have chickens and ducks and geese just basically for my own use. It has quite a few obstacles in it. It's a challenge to figure out how to hook things up alone and just mechanical work wise, it's not an easy occupation but it's something I've enjoyed my whole life. I grew up on a farm, so it's just been my lifestyle all these years. As far as financing, I would say it's gotten better over the years because from the beginning, I always felt that they kind of were hesitant about loaning me money, being a single person, especially a lady. They seemed like they didn't want to work with you quite as well, but now I really can't say that I have issues as far as financing, but sometimes when you're out looking for equipment otherwise, I kind of feel they still kind of are hesitant to deal quite as good as probably would with a man. Years ago, the women were more so stay-at-home moms and took care of things on the farm, which now most of the women work off the farm and it's a little different. I really enjoy cutting hay and driving the tractors and just the peacefulness of being on the farm and the solitude of working alone. You got to be really dedicated because it is a lot of hard work. And you got to really love what you're doing in order to make it work and to have a good life of it. Many times she would butcher the chickens the night before during harvest and we'd hang them in the well. And then of course she would end up frying them and then baking them. And then of course there were all the pies and that of course out to this day, as my aunt would say, if you spell it P-I-E, it's got to be good. And that was before we had electricity. And of course my job was to have my nose into everything and set the table and get everything ready. And all the thrashers would then come in to eat at noon. And it usually would be right at noon because then at three or four in the afternoon, whatever was available, my dad had a 28 Ford. And so that's how we would take lunch out to the field for the guys then. And then mom would take kuha out and cookies and it was grab your sandwiches, grab your kuha, grab your cookie or whatever. And then we always had these large jugs, glass jugs. And of course at that time there was no ice. We opened up the well just like a door. And there was a bar across there. And then there was a rope connected and a pail, and a rope and a pail, and a rope and a pail, and a rope and a pail. <laughs> so probably in the first pail, my mother would put in the cream to make butter. And the next one, she'd probably put the fresh chickens she just butchered for tomorrow. And then, of course, there'd be one for jello, and I mean, on down the line. So that was our refrigerator before 46. Our well had very cold water. So then mom would fill these jugs with water and then she would tie gunny sacks around these jugs. And then she would dip those jugs with the gunny sacks around into the tank. And so those sacks would be all wet. And so then every crew had their own jug of water which was saturated with these gunny sacks so it would stay cool. Many times it would not include the evening meal because by then everybody was so half dead they wanted to go home. <laughs> so usually it was not the evening meal. I dearly loved the farm. I loved the seclusion, the quiet, the peace. 
I'm definitely a farm girl. I did love my teaching career. It was wonderful. But farm is the only place to live, in my opinion. Some women are really into it. I mean, they do everything that the husband does. I mean, they help with the cattle, the vaccination. There are some families that the woman is totally involved. In fact, they're co-partners. There is no life that is more satisfying or more wonderful than to be in the country and basically be your own boss. And in all the years I was in teaching, every summer we'd be back at the farm. And of course at nights too, we'd be driving from Lenton to the farm to work. We were always involved in farming and I loved it. I think growing up on a farm, I learned a good work ethic. I learned that nothing is handed to you. You have to work for what you want and life doesn't come easy. Things aren't always the way that you want them to be, but you have to push through and eventually come out the other side. I hoped that I would marry a farmer and honestly, I enjoy the ranching aspect of farming and ranching better, which my husband does also. So I feel like this is the life that I've always wanted. And my mom makes the comment often, she goes, Mark is the exact person that I thought that you would find someday. We always have the kids. I don't send my kids to daycare, they're always with us. So whatever we're doing, they're with us. And the thing that I enjoy is that they love this lifestyle also, which makes it easier for all of us. Last year, when we were seeding beans, I had four kids in a tractor rolling beans from five to eight hours a day. And they did great. They look out the window and talk and read books and color, and I am thankful that I get to take them along and that they tolerate it also. I do have a support group of other women. Nowadays with social media technology, text messaging, all of that kind of thing, I can keep in contact and still feel like I'm not isolated in the middle of nowhere and just yearning for that adult interaction. Nowadays, we're spoiled. We've got good equipment, we've got cabs, we've got air conditioning. Our third child, she has allergies. And so if I had to have her out on some kind of cabless machine or something like that, it wouldn't work well for her. So I think that we are very fortunate to have the technology that we do have. It gets to be a lot, but it's worth it. This lifestyle is worth all of the long days, the long nights. We see each other every day, and the other thing that I'm thankful for is that I get to stay home to raise our kids. They miss Mark. There's long days to where he's gone before they're up in the morning, he's home after they're in bed, but we have the option to take meals to the field so where they can see him for 10 or 15 minutes, or he's very good about taking them along with him. So we just make the best of it because complaining about it isn't gonna make it any better. It's a simple life. And I think that we take for granted what we have here because this is our norm. I feel like, me especially, how lucky and fortunate we are to be surrounded by just such beautiful views and land. If anybody came to me being interested in being in agriculture, I would encourage them. I feel like being in agriculture teaches you great lifelong skills and lifelong lessons as far as the peaks and valleys. There's good years, there's bad years. There's good times and bad times. And as long as you persevere through the bad times, the good times are that much better. So we rented a farm, not too by St. Michael's area, half a mile from the church. I, I would never move in there again. That house was insulated with ash. And you should have seen the mice. Man, oh life. When we moved the fridge, we had to use a big shovel to carry the ash out. The one we bought had electricity. And that was an old house too. And then we tore everything out. It was all one room. And then we added on two bedrooms and a bathroom. We were the first people out there that had the water in the house and that had like the furnace. Oh, we thought we were in heaven. <laughs> when we lived on the farm, Pete and I, 
I always had to help out at the farm. I worked hard in my life. We were raking hay, and Pete was sitting on the rake, and I was driving the tractor. And I turned around too short, and that tongue from the rake came in here and broke my leg. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that was painful. So that was the last time that summer I went out because I had my leg in the cast for about six weeks or so. And then we sometimes we heathered, you know what a heather is? And I had to be on the heather box and shh, I'd take the fork and stack that, whatever it was we heathered. I hated that part. I didn't like that. <laughs> I did everything on the farm except I didn't plow. We had to clean the barn. <laughs> oh, I had to clean that barn a lot of times. Even when we were married, while well, in the springtime, Pete had to go out and do the field work, and somebody had to clean that barn the cows were in. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of work on a farm. That's why I'm old. I worked hard. <laughs> I was raised on the farm, and I didn't really want to move to town. I hated it. When we went to Bismarck, I came home once in a while, and the minute we drove into Linton, I just hated it. I did not want to move to town. I liked it out there. We live up there on the hill. It is such a nice location. Oh, I wish you could go out there and see it now. We liked it on the farm. Our kids did, too. It was so nice. In the evening, we had a pasture about a mile away. When we were done with everything, we, the kids and me and Pete, we drove out, checked the cattle, and it was so nice, all these little calves. And, <laughs> and we raised a lot of chickens. One year, we had 500 chickens. We butchered them all and sold them. So it was a little extra income. Growing up on a farm, living an agrarian life, there were some strong women in my life. My Aunt Lydia lived next door. I don't think there was a piece of machinery she didn't like. She was good at everything in the house and out. Good with the animals. I was always so interested to see how much she seemed to enjoy farm life. My Aunt Elaine, I don't believe she slept. She worked from morning till night, had five sons and a daughter, but she could milk those cows, come in, make breakfast, go back out, work in the yard, come in, make lunch, and then she would go back out. This was, it seemed all summer long. She was amazing. My observation is that opportunities for women or young girls on the farm are there provided there's availability of land. In our family, we have the gift that my nephew is the third generation running that farm. So if his daughters or his son choose to farm, at least they likely would have a farm to do it. So let me tell you about my great niece, Carly. She lives on the farm I grew up on and loves her animals, loves her goat, loves horses, but loves her roosters and chickens has started a little cottage industry for those who want free-range eggs. And she and her dad built a couple of little different chicken coops. And I am so happy to see this full circle happen. On our farm, we grow crops and cattle. I have roughly around 25 chickens, and we have two coops, and they just kind of do their own thing, come in, Throughout the day, lay their eggs. They are free range, so they get the whole farm to wander around. And we get about, I want to say, around two dozen eggs a day. At school, I sell the eggs to the teachers. They buy a lot of them, and then just community members, family, everybody just buys eggs from me, it seems like. My mom was in 4-H, my grandma was in 4-H, now I'm in 4-H. It's kind of a family thing. I absolutely love it. It's shaped me as the person I am today because of all the leadership skills I've learned. And nowadays it is not just all agriculture. You can do sewing, 
cooking, you can do just about anything in 4-H. There's definitely some males in my class that think that farming isn't meant for a woman, so I have faced a lot of that because they claim that women aren't strong enough and women don't know enough about agriculture. Nowadays, anybody can become a farmer, and I especially have it good because my dad's a farmer and he is cool with me farming and everything. For three generations, it's only been males farming, so I'd kind of like to be the first female to become the fourth generation. It's really hard to become a farmer because you don't have a set salary. That's why it scares a lot of people away from agriculture because if there's one bad storm, it could wipe out your whole farm and you could be broke. If a woman came up to me saying that they were interested in agriculture, I would definitely tell them that anything is possible because in this world today, women can do anything and they can do it just as well as a man. It's different all the time, the lifestyle of farming. We always say we work hard and we play hard. You know, it's one of the things that, that happens with farming. You've got your seasons and you're going to be busy and tension will be there. There is no doubt tension will be there, but it's all worth it in the end because you get to work together and it's just a whole different kind of a lifestyle than any other kind of a job I can imagine. All going your separate ways in the morning and only seeing each other at night. You know, we see each other throughout the day. Like I said, some days aren't always as good as other days, but it's a whole different kind of a lifestyle. One of the biggest downfalls with farming and being our own is the health insurance. Health insurance is huge. And I wish there were a system that helped us, you know, to get a a decent price of a plan but when you're independent you know the health insurance is what kills so many of us it's like wow that's a big bill each month if you can have a job that helps cover that it's tremendous my mom says that how the roles have changed when I'll tell her I've got to get home we've got bailing to do or I'm gonna haul and she always says that's something I never would have done she didn't bail or do that kind of stuff, where now the role has definitely progressed. Mom didn't help tremendously with the field work, but she had nine kids at home too. There was always a little one, and so for her the field work wasn't done like it is. She always says, I wouldn't have gone out to do that kind of stuff. She left that up to dad. I always say a great aspect of keeping the farmers going and everything running is the behind the scenes and feeding them is a big one. Usually when we're busy times of the year, they don't stop to eat. So delivering coolers to all the tractors and finding everybody is a big feat. And I think it's an unsung aspect that, you know, a lot of us women do it. And it means a lot to the guys to be out there and, oh, here comes the meal. It's very admirable because you're feeding people and you can be proud of what you do. It's hard work, but to me it's an admirable job for somebody to do. And your faith has to be very high. You start the day with your faith and you end the day with your faith. That's what gets you through a day. You need someone at your side. <laughs> that's, that's always rooting for you. When we were third graders, I know we were 11 of us. Then we would draw a lot. So that spring, we all flunked the third grade. And none of our parents really scolded us. They just said that we couldn't draw so much the next year. So the next year, of course, we didn't draw that much. And by Christmas time, we got promoted to the fourth grade. And at the end of the school year, we were promoted to the fifth grade, so we were really good the next year. I took high school by correspondence, and then I'd go into school and get some information there. But I did it at home with correspondence because the, just my sister and myself, you know, we had to help along at home. And then the rest of them went to school, but we did our own thing at home. It was a lot of work, but 
it worked out because then I took one year of college that way. And then, of course, in the fall, her and me would hire out to shock bundles and, and stuff like that for other farmers. My sister and myself, we got to have a barn dance. Our barn burned down the year before. And then when the barn was all done, but there was no hay up there yet, we got to have a barn dance with all the neighbors. Just neighbors and no cigarettes, no booze, no nothing. And we did. And then Leo Gevro, he introduced us to these, you know, and he had said we should get, get them to dance. After they were gone, then my sister and me talked about, you know, these guys, and I said, yeah, I, I, I thought George was rather good looking. <laughs> my sister said his name wasn't George, his name was L. And I found out it was, and that's how I met him. Everybody always referred to the women as Mrs. So-and-so. They didn't have names and in church cookbooks and those sorts of things. Even looking at um, different, you know, old 4-H records, it was Mrs. So-and-so. And I feel like they didn't always get their own identity like they do now. There's a lot of things that are different from when I was a child growing up in a rural area to now for women. The roles of women have changed so much. You used to only ever see maybe teachers and the hospital type of setting. And now when you look at agriculture, your agronomist might be a woman. Going to the elevator might be a woman helping you. There's a lot of women in agriculture actually paid <laughs> positions now that I guess growing up as a child were always kind of considered a men's job. When you grow up in a small rural area and you're connected to agriculture in your roots, I think that when you leave, you still have this desire to want to, you know, maybe be, or these ties to want to be back to where you kind of grew up. And I didn't really have that as much until I had children. And once I had children, I started having, I guess, urge, so to speak, to want to be able to raise them in a rural area so they could understand what agriculture and how important rural life was. I'm in the schools a lot. I do a lot of nutrition programming, where your food comes from. And every year, I'll have kids that don't know what food group an egg is. We're rural America, and to have a fifth grader say, well, an egg is a vegetable, it really makes me think, wow. There is such a disconnect with agriculture. An egg is not a vegetable, and I've had to say it more than once. Do you plant a chicken? in your garden and you get an egg and they look at me so silly and they say, no. But sometimes even living in a rural area, they're not always living on the farm. They're not maybe exposed to that. Some of the st things that I feel like growing up on a farm, I just learned and I take for granted. And I feel like as a mother, I really try to talk to my children about where their food comes from and what food group is. And while I live in a rural area, my kids don't actually live on a farm. So I feel like that's for me is a concern is just having youth understand where their food comes from and what agriculture is and how important agriculture is to absolutely every single thing that they do. I always wanted animals, and so my dad told me I should marry a farmer. And I married a farmer, and we moved to Zealand in November of 1979, and we started out with 25 cows. I had to learn everything. I didn't know what I was doing, basically. How long to milk the cows, how to feed calves. I grew up in a home where there were three girls, so coming to a family where there was all boys, it was hard for them to adjust to a girl wanting to be outside and work. And so I think that was probably my biggest issue was I felt like I had to prove myself all the time. 
I believe it's changed because I believe there are more women that are in agriculture now that have bit the bullet and just done it. I think that back when I was younger, it was a scary thing. And I think that when things happened to people's husbands, I don't know how many women actually stayed on the farm. I think now that men have adjusted to the fact that women can farm, I could totally see any one of my girls farming because of what they were taught. We have three daughters, Alicia, Kristen, and Emily. They worked hard. They all had to feed calves. I would say by the time they could walk, they probably held a bottle in their hand to feed calves. We always told them that we could have never farmed if they wouldn't have helped. After Tom passed away, we were very fortunate that the farm was paid for. There were people that thought I should sell out. They didn't know what I wanted here, but this is our home. We were on this farm for 34 and a half years together. I don't know where else I'd wanna be right now. As far as men in the community, I have my handful of men who were totally awesome that came to help and still come to help. No questions. Pretty much let me make the decisions, but are always there to help if I need help. She is actually a crop adjuster and she's always been my go-to person in the last three and a half years. She comes home and helps me do things. After Tom passed away, she put the hay down for me and I bailed it. So we're kind of a team and her goal someday is to farm this farm. Growing up on my family farm was interesting. Uh, I would have not wanted to grow up any other way. I loved it, it taught me discipline. It taught me how to nurture baby animals. It taught me everything in my life and I would have not wanted to grow up in any other way. I wanna take over the farm. I'm definitely gonna to have to have another job to do this. Health insurance is a big deal. It boggles my mind how expensive it is for something that people need in life. So to have a job that will either A, pay for it, or B, help you pay for it, will make life 100 times easier. And with my crop adjusting job, it's pretty flexible. So I can still help in the field. I can still help plant if we're not busy. I can still fix fence, do all of those things, but yet I still have a job that I will be able to collect a paycheck and help with bills and all of that stuff. If a young man's coming back to farm, what's his wife supposed to do? Because if he's coming home to a 500 acre farm, there's no way that they can both farm. She's gonna need a job. And you usually have to drive 25, 30 miles for that job. It is very hard to be a woman in agriculture. It was an adjustment to be a woman in agronomy because dealing with old German farmers who are stern in a way and Roundup's gonna kill everything and I don't need all this other stuff. It's hard to explain to them that you can't spray Roundup all the time. It's gonna become resistant. We need to make a different plan and for them to listen to a 21 year old girl who's just came out of college is very hard. I wish that I would have more women to look up to in the agriculture world. So I'm hoping that I can be a big part of that my best friends, I hope that they have little girls who want to farm or marry a farmer and at least be able to say, well, I got to drive a tractor today. That was my job. One person said to me one time that I don't understand how you can farm. You put so much money into it and you don't get anything back. And I just laughed and I said, people don't farm to be rich. People farm because they love it. Right away when I first got married, I think the idea of women working out of the house was like, ah, you know, you should be home helping out on the farm. Because I got patted on the back sometimes for staying home helping out, but it's changed over the years, you know? People realize that one income just isn't enough nowadays, especially with that health insurance problem. So it has changed, the attitude has really changed. People aren't making comments anymore to people that are working off the farm. 
Daycare is a problem nowadays. Basically, the daycare they have in our hometown, they're all full. We've got a lot of young people back home in our hometown, which is nice to see. And they are having a difficult time finding daycare. So those mothers are actually staying home and helping out in the farm. They're just, you know, it's kind of nice to see that happen, but yet I know that they struggle too because there's just no daycare. I think my pitching in helps because I do a lot of the little stuff. I do the bookkeeping, I do the yard work, I run all the errands, I run and get parts, I help with the chores, I help milk cows, I feed calves, I clean barn, bale hay, I rake hay, I cut hay, I truck, I do a lot of trucking, a lot of trucking when it comes to harvest time. Without all that help, I don't know if it would be feasible. I think my husband would end up finding somebody to help on the farm. I'm free, where hiring somebody would cost. And that's the one thing my husband's always said, you know what's going on. He said, if I have to hire somebody, I gotta teach them all over. He said, where well, you know the business and you care, so why would we wanna hire somebody? Dairy farming is on the decline. It's kind of sad to say, but most dairy farmers in our area are our age. There aren't many that are much younger and basically nobody wants to take it over because you don't get no time off. You're there 365 days out of the year. You're there twice a day. To find somebody to come in and help, you need to find somebody that knows what they're doing because it is a risky business. It's something you gotta be very careful when you're milking cows. You know, you, you want quality milk. I am number 11 in a family of 12, six boys and six girls. The older siblings, of course, worked a lot harder than I did. My oldest sister was married before I was born. In 51, my parents moved to town, so I got to go to high school. First one in the family. The saying always was for girls to go to high school, you don't need high school to wash diapers. The chores I had to do, I had to help with the milking, feeding calves, and of course, picking the unending rocks. Rocks and rocks. We'd have a trailer. We'd pull it with two horses, of course, and all of us would be out and around and picking up. There's another one over there, go get it. And then when it was haying time, I had to drive the team of horses we had a couple of tractors, but for haying and things like that, the horses were much better. My parents were older, so they were a little better, a little more established. They had a little money already by the time I was growing up. But then after I got married, then we started at the bottom again. <laughs> we milked a few cows and rented you know our first two farms were rented and then once we moved to the venturia area then we had more cows and kids and we raised a family of seven so we milked as high as 80 cows twice a day <laughs> seven days a week and that's how we raised our family I always said, we never go any place because of the milk cows. Well, all of a sudden in 86, the milk cows went goodbye and we still didn't go any place. There is nothing like waking up in the morning, looking out over the fields with your cup of coffee, anticipating the work of the day, working with your family, working with your children, and providing food for the world. I mean, that's what farmers do. They feed the world. Is there anything else that could be more rewarding? I can't imagine.
Production funding for Women Behind the Plow is provided by the Tri-County Tourism Alliance, the Op Mertz family, the NDSU Library's Germans from Russia Heritage Collection, McIntosh County Bank, the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public. To order a DVD copy of Women Behind the Plow, please call 1-800-359-6900.